we started Dead Air Live in the November of 74, you know, Dead Air. And uh, we said, yeah, and we wanted to do it live, so hence the name Dead Air Live. What we did was that we just take an image like this and move it around and think just different crazy effects, anything, anything went. We get, we get a little, we get response though. People like the show, you know. They will call in, and we had different people call in. Like there was one guy called Radio. Dead Air Live expands your mind. Yeah. It blows my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to Dead Air Live. My name is Eliza Gleason. And our topic for this evening is lead paint controlling the risk. Uh, we will be discussing the dangers of lead paint, its detection in one's home and property, and its removal. It's a subject which is important and relevant for property owners, tenants, and parents as well. I'd like to introduce the guests for the first segment of the program. To my left is Dr. Owen Mathieu uh, from Boston City Hospital, a pediatrician there. And to his left is Fran Rosnowski, a community organizer from Chelsea. And to her left is Paul Hunter from the Childhood Lead Paint Poisoning Prevention Program of the Department of Public Health. Good evening. Welcome to everybody, and thanks very much for being here. Um, I think a good way to begin our discussion on the subject of lead paint is to discuss what exactly is lead poisoning. And I think, um, Dr. Mathieu, you would be the, probably the best person to answer some of these questions on lead poisoning um, and why lead point paint is dangerous um, for children. Um, what exactly is lead poisoning? Well, lead poisoning is a uh, symptom complex that can take on many forms and uh, appear in many different ways. Uh, this is probably the uh, oldest persistent environmental health issue that we have. Um, uh, we've known about lead poisoning for well over 2,000 years. Uh, Greek and Roman uh, physicians uh, describe the same kinds of symptoms that we talk about today, uh, mm -hmm. for example. And we've known for the last uh, 80 or 90 years that uh, lead paint was the primary source of this problem uh, in children. And for about the last 50 years or so, we've had a pretty good idea of the kinds of problems it can cause in children. Uh, lead enters the body, some of it is excreted, some of it is stored. All of us absorb a certain amount of lead each day. It's in the air, it's in the water, it's in the food we eat. We as adults absorb and, and keep about 5% of the lead that we take in and we excrete about the other 95%. Small children, preschool children, uh, absorb 50 to 60 percent of the lead that they take in, uh, keep rather, about 50 to 60 percent of the lead that they absorb and excrete only the uh, uh, relatively uh, small uh, remainder. Mm. Uh, lead can get into uh, every organ system of the body. It can affect most notoriously the kidneys and the things that we worry about the most, the uh, blood forming uh, system and the brain. Uh, lead actually enters the uh, red cell and prevents the synthesis of hemoglobin, which is the protein in the red cells that carries nutrients and oxygen throughout the body. And lead also enters the brain and causes uh, quite a bit of uh, damage in the form of edema and the destruction of brain cells. Uh, it's this last uh, issue that uh, we as pediatricians are the most concerned about uh, because um, uh, this situation can lead to long-term effects. Uh, once you have this kind of damage in the brain, it cannot be reversed. Mm. The other effects of lead uh, throughout the other parts of the body can be at least stopped if you take the lead away. Uh, however, if the uh, lead damages the brain enough, uh, the brain will retain that damage permanently. Mm. So uh, when you say what is lead poisoning, it can be any number of things. It might be a child who comes in with um, uh, failure to gain weight because of poor appetite 
or a child who has clumsiness or poor speech development, uh, a child who uh, exhibits the loss of newly acquired skills, a child who exhibits pica, which is the tendency to eat uh, uh, substances that are not food, uh, or it might be none of these. And it might be a child who, um, when a child gets into school uh, in the first or second grade, uh, does not live up to his full potential because he's lost some points on his IQ scale, mm -hmm. if you want to look at it that way, uh, because of this problem. Yeah. What are some of the long-term effects for children who've been poisoned? Well, the major long-term effect is um, uh, poor school performance, inattentiveness in school, uh, an inability to uh, regulate himself or herself, uh, hyperactivity, and uh, these kinds of uh, developmental and uh, behavioral mm -hmm. and school performance mm -hmm. issues. Those are the primary long-term effects that we worry about right, with children. Right. Um, why are children most susceptible um, as opposed to adults? Well, is there, it there, are, there are two reasons. One is that um, a small child is developing and maturing uh, for a number of years after, after birth, and uh, therefore anything that interferes with uh, the parts of the child's body that are developing and maturing, and the brain is a, a good example of an organ that really is changing its structure over a period of time. Anything, anything that interferes with this process will have long-term damaging mm -hmm. effects. We as adults are fairly well set, and we can have some damage, but we do not um, uh, have the ill effects from that damage the same way as you do in children. Right. And secondly, the other issue is what I mentioned at the beginning, that children absorb some uh, and uh, retain so much of the lead that they're exposed to, whereas adults absorb and retain relatively little of the lead that they're exposed to. Right. So there are two issues. Right. Is it, I think people have the um, conception that it's children who pick up and eat chips of paint. Is that the only way that yeah, no, children no, no, could Nothing could be uh, more incorrect. Uh, we've learned uh, in recent years that uh, the, the primary problem that we have and the primary source of lead for children is uh, dust and soil. Mm -hmm. um, any child sitting around a floor on a floor where there's dust that's lead burdened will sooner or later uh, get his hands into mm -hmm. that dust and, as all children do, put their hands in the mouth and that's how they become lead poisoned. Mm -hmm. And over time, that amount of poisoning from that little bit of constant stream can be quite severe. Uh, secondly, we're learning more and more about lead in the soil, and we know that uh, lead uh, paint on the outside of a home that's degenerating gets into the soil, and again, children play in the dirt, mm -hmm. get dirt on their hands, and that's a, also a major source of a lead poisoning. Yeah. We also know that uh, a person will track lead burdened soil inside the house from the outside, and that will get into the dust. Right. So that's another uh, uh, way that dust and soil issues are sort of mixed. Right. So what are the, some of the symptoms um, for well, that? You the, mentioned the, some so, of them. Yeah, what the, the, the symptoms might be subtle. Uh, in fact, I, I'm impressed that uh, very often uh, most of the cases that we uh, discover and treat are children who the parents have not noticed anything at all. And these are children who have been picked up uh, through screening programs at their clinics or at their uh, physician's uh, offices. Mm -hmm. um, in retrospect, we'll ask a family, well, now that your child's out of the hospital, you notice, you notice that he's anything any different. And a parent will often say, well, yes, I, I notice he's, he's been bad lately. Mm. And uh, what they're usually saying is that the child has been mischievous and inquisitive, mm. whereas before the child was very quiet and right. docile. So it might just be an activity level that'll be right. a sign or a symptom. Yeah. Another thing parents will often say is that their children are eating more now than they did before. And we find that appetite suppression is a very common uh, sign of uh, lead poisoning. Mm. Um, how many cases of lead poisoning occur each year? Perhaps, Paul, you might know some the, of the figures. Um, say in Massachusetts, for example, about how many children are poisoned each year. During 1988, we identified roughly 1,000 children across Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to point out, too, that a common misconception that lead poisoning really only occurs in uh, really high-risk urban settings, mm -hmm. the ghettos as they might be called, is really uh, incorrect. And we, when we do identify lead poisoned children, they have been uh, in over 100 communities in Massachusetts and can range from the most urban to the most rural. Uh, and it's also important to point out that uh, fewer than half of the children at risk for the potentially uh, being lead poisoned are screened annually in Massachusetts. And we're hopeful that uh, pediatricians working with the department 
we'll develop a mandatory screening schedule mm. so that uh, a larger percent of those children at risk will in fact be tested for the disease. Right, right. What, at what level is um, a child considered poisoned when their blood is tested? What well, the, the, uh, the level that we're using right now is a level of 25 mm -hmm. micrograms of lead per 100 mm -hmm. uh, uh, cc's of blood. Right. Uh, but it's important to realize that that number is, um, uh, there's nothing uh, sort of physiologic that suddenly happens at that level, mm -hmm. whereas below that you're safe and above that you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. And we have um, uh, physiologic evidence and uh, some people would say developmental evidence that uh, much lower levels than that are probably harmful to right. children. Right. Uh, lead is one thing that we we shouldn't have any of in our body. Yeah. When, uh, if a child has been poisoned, what is the cure? Or is there a cure? How is it removed from their system? Well, we have um, uh, drugs uh, that we use to chelate uh, lead out of the system. And there are um, about three or four that are commonly used today. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these medications require that the child be admitted to a hospital and that they be given intravenously. Uh, others can be given uh, on an outpatient basis orally. Um, over a longer period of time, however. Uh, all of these medications uh, carry risks with them. Mm -hmm. There's a fairly high incidence of side effects associated with all of them. Uh, we think that these risks, however, are uh, greatly outweighed by the risks of keeping the lead in the, right. uh, in the system. But the lead can be dealt with. Problem, however, is that if you have a child who's exposed for a prolonged period of time, the child will store an awful lot of lead in the bone. And when we uh, evaluate a child, basically all that, all that we can conveniently look at is lead in the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's important to understand that we never really are sure we've completely gotten all of the lead out of the child's yeah. system. Mm -hmm. And there are some cases of how this lead might come out at a later point in a right. child's life. Right. But you might not know how the disease will manifest itself until later in their, That's right. in their life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it seems that um, children are sort of our detectors of of whether we have lead paint, um, and I know perhaps that's been your experience, Fran. You've witnessed some children who've been who've been poisoned um, by lead and seen the effects of that. Um, what is what has been your experience in in seeing children who have been poisoned? Well, I think it's aggravating because we're using children and we're interfering with their potential. Mm -hmm. um, what we do know is that the damage which is caused is permanent mm -hmm. um, and that even if a child has been chelated, has received treatment, um, that that child is not going to do in well in school mm -hmm. and outside of school. Um, and so that what we would like is that homes are inspected. Um, in, in the case of Chelsea where I'm from, we also have the Mystic Tobin Bridge mm -hmm. um, which spans the entire, uh, the entire city and it's also contained with lead and what we would like is that it be deleaded because the paint is flaking yeah. so that instead of just testing the children um, that we know that the lead is there mm -hmm. because 95% uh, of the homes in Chelsea are older homes as in the majority of the cities yeah. in Massachusetts right. as Paul said um, and to take it from that perspective mm -hmm. to get the lead out before damage is right. done to children. Right. You mentioned inspection and that's a good lead in to our our insert tape which we have here. Um, inspections can be done in homes to find out whether there is lead paint existing in a home. Um, there are a couple methods of testing um, and in our tape we have a representative from the Massachusetts Association of Lead Paint Analyzers demonstrate one of these methods of test with the use of an x-ray fluorescence machine. The second method is also um, used in Massachusetts. It's a uh, chemical, sodium sulfide. So why don't we watch the tape and come back to discuss inspections and uh, detecting lead paint in one's home. Let's go to that tape now. Good morning. My name is David Renner. I'm from Middlesex Lead Inspection and Removal, Inc. And we're located out of Wakefield, Massachusetts. I'm here today in association with uh, MALPA, Massachusetts Association of Lead and Paint Analyzers, and we are going to demonstrate today, as well as discuss, the advantages and disadvantages of using an x-ray fluorescence test over the use of sodium sulfide to determine the presence of lead in paint. What I'd first like to do is just point out some of the pros and cons 
of the use of an X-ray fluorescence analyzer versus the sodium sulfide. Sodium is a chemical I have over here on the table that I'll just pick up and show. It's the use of a chemical, sodium sulfide, which is a crystal mixed with the correct solution of distilled water. When that is placed on paint and you cut into it to get down to the bottom layer of paint, which is usually the lead, it reacts by turning black. When that happens, it tells you that there is a presence of lead in the paint. However, it cannot tell you the exact count of that. There are levels of lead that are legal and can remain. In the state of Massachusetts, that level is 1.2 milligrams per centimeter squared. That is a formulation that is divided by HUD. What we use is an X-ray fluorescence analyzer that I will pick up right here and just briefly show you. This here measures, again, in milligrams per centimeter squared. What you do is hold the probe of this machine on any surface that you're testing, and it will take counts of it. It reads it in a fluid state by fluorescing all the elements on the surface that you're using, and then it reacts and reads the elements to lead which are unique in the machine through the use of a cobalt source. Some of the advantages of the use of x-ray it can read through 25 layers of paint. It is non-destructive. It can be zeroed in to read on any surface. You can zero it in to read on wood, concrete, plaster, metals, some of the zeroing standard blocks I have brought with me over here. And what you do is you put the probe on each of these surfaces. You calibrate the machine into them. That way, if you're testing on a wall that may have a lead pipe, or wires behind there, you know by the use of working with the machine if you're getting any background readings that may throw your readings off, whereas other types of testing cannot do this. So we are not, we can test on any surface. The sodium, however, cannot be used on metals because it will react sometimes to the titanium, to copper, and give you false positives. Other advantages of the use of x-ray is that there is no guesswork. You read the count in milligrams per centimeter squared. It's not, it looks like it's turning black. It may be lead. You have an exact determination immediately after you take the specific amount of shots required. How do you begin your procedure of inspection? Okay, when we come on to the property, what we'll do is we bring all the machinery inside and we go to the exterior of the home and the interior of the home and we start formatting all of the shots that are going to need to be taken in that home to bring it, to test it to compliance with the Massachusetts lead law. That means going into a room, identifying all the window component surfaces, all the door component surfaces, ceilings, wall, baseboards, anything that may be in a particular room that needs to be tested. We do it before we even turn the machine on. How many areas do you test in one room? In one room, that can vary anywhere from, I'd say, between 20 and 100. Before we started, the machine was already zeroed into wood, and we have the calibration point already set. So we know that the readings that we're taking here are going to be accurate. I don't know if the microphone is picking up the little beeping that's going on here. That to us is a change of density indicator, meaning that we know by the wood, plaster, or metal what the density is. If there's any change to that out of the ordinary, we could be getting backdrops, uh, electrical lead pipes or anything and you know to throw that reading out and take another one. This particular door right here had a level of 32.6 uh, milligrams per centimeter squared, which is over the state limit of 1.2. When we take that reading, Janet records it on the door for this wall, and then also she notes the condition of the door, and then we move on to do the casing in the jam.
What's happening now is the probe has just opened and is fluorescing all the elements in the surface right here. And it is what does is it echoes back from that surface, and the machine is reading it. Right now, it has just given us a reading of 34.0. Also, before we go on to other walls, we also shoot the ceilings and the floors. Even though you would look at this floor where it's hard wood, there are levels of lead that were in stains, varnishes, and other materials. So even though this is a flat surface and would not need to be deleaded even if there was lead here, it must be maintained intact. To, so there is no danger from this floor at all. Welcome back to the studio. This is Dead Air Live. Our subject tonight is lead paint. We've just watched a tape on an inspection of a house for detection of lead paint. I'm wondering, Paul, if you have any comments about the inspection that we just saw on the tape. Well, I would point out that in Massachusetts there are two allowable methods for identifying lead in paint. One is the use of x-ray fluorescence, as we've seen on the tape. Uh, the other is the use of the chemical sodium sulfide, which in chemical reaction with lead in paint causes a color change to dark gray or black, mm -hmm. so that an inspector may come in, simply remove a chip of paint from any given surface, uh, preferably some discrete area where it won't have any uh, detrimental effects on the aesthetics of the property. They will test that chip and if there is a color change that will indicate that there's lead present in that surface. I'd also uh, point out that in Massachusetts now there are really uh, two ways of having a lead inspection. Uh, one is by contacting either your local health department or the state lead program, uh, which is the office that I work with in uh, Jamaica Plain, uh, and there are also now approximately 200 private lead inspectors who are registered with the state uh, and are qualified to conduct lead inspections uh, for property owners uh, interested in determining the amount of lead in any given dwelling in Massachusetts. So if a property owner was interested in getting a lead paint test, can they contact your office to get some information? We give priority, obviously, number one, to lead poison children in our inspections, and then to tenant requests. Uh, and I would say, for the most part, uh, presently, private property owners uh, have been encouraged to utilize the services of a private registered lead inspector. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, by doing so, they also uh, eliminate the risk of criminal complaint being brought by the Department of Public Health if they fail to remove that lead paint within seven days. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what does an inspection tell you? Is it just exactly where the lead paint is and what, how you have to remove it? Or? Well, the lead paint inspection itself will really document for a property owner or a tenant precisely where the lead paint is. And then I suggest that their next step would be to contact a certified uh, de-leading contractor, mm -hmm. a contractor who has been uh, certified with the Department of Labor and Industries to safely remove lead paint. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's often said that the process of removing lead paint can be more dangerous or leave a greater hazard uh, than to leave the paint alone. And I think the real question is how it's removed and who does it. Mm -hmm. And any lead paint that's identified in Massachusetts must be removed by a certified contractor. Uh, those folks should have the proper equipment uh, and they should be thoroughly familiar with the regulations for its safe removal. Well, we'll go into deleting a little bit more later on in the show. Um, I just wanted to give Fran a chance to discuss your experience in Chelsea and the group you organized there against lead paint. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened? Sure. Chelsea is unique in Massachusetts because in addition to having the housing, which has a lot of lead paint in it, we also have the Mystic Tobin Bridge. Um, and back in 83, Massport was deletting the bridge and there was concern of a lot of the neighbors who lived in the area because we were giving enormous blast plastic bags to cover our cars and yet there was no concern given to the residents in the neighborhood. Uh, Massport proposed coming in 
in screening um, the people who lived within a 600 uh, foot margin of the bridge going to their home door to door to do a blood test. And a number of people got involved within that because they were only going to do it during the day. Well, a lot of people aren't home, particularly in the springtime, which is when this occurred. So we got a lot of the neighbors together um, to get uh, trained in the testing. And we were also provide the service in Spanish. Um, and the residents felt much more comfortable because we were neighbors already. Um, we were also very concerned because there was a lot of grit. There was a lot of lead dust in the air. I had it sampled in front of the daycare center where I work, which is located directly under the bridge. And it had 40,000 parts per, uh, per unit, which is this astronomically This was the soil in high. front of the... No, this was just dirt in between the cracks of the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. um, and so we pretty much authorized ourselves as being a watchdog committee. And we would call them when we think that there, we thought there was too much grit blowing around. Um, and we also did a lot of education. Um, what we did in addition to that was when the deletting was done, we made sure that Massport came back the following year to do a blood screening program for the entire city. Um, because we felt that it was their responsibility um, just for the area near the bridge, but other children were also affected by mm -hmm. um, lead poisoning. And so over 1,300 children were tested. And again, what was important was that we were able to do it in English, Spanish, Cambodian, and Vietnamese. Um, the other work that we've done is um, we've done a lot of education, whether it's at the local mall, whether it's at the library, whether it's at English as a second language courses, adult education courses, just letting people know about lead paint. Uh, we've also done soil testing in the local playgrounds just to make sure that our playgrounds are safe for our kids because a lot of times our backyards are not safe places for the kids to play. Yeah. Um, we've worked closely with Suffolk County Extension and done soil testing in our yards not only by the bridge but throughout the city and have found very, very high levels and so we've been able to educate people about that. Um, we've also done some water sampling with a company up in New Hampshire Water Test. They have tested Chelsea's water samples for free so that people can get a sense of that. I think one of the most important things that we've done though is provided support to parents as well as kids who have been lead poisoned mm -hmm. um, because it is very difficult. Um, what Dr. Mithun did not mention was how very painful the chelation is um, and just how very difficult and trying it is for parents, um, particularly if they're single parents and don't have enough resources to begin with, that going over to Children's Hospital um, or Boston City Hospital for the treatment is trying. And mm -hmm. so a lot of times it's just support, providing support to one another. Right. And um, the, the treatment last goes thing, on for, for a while, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, until the child's um, lead level is or there are constant uh, monitorings of that. Um, and finally, what we've been able to do because of our um, expertise, which we've developed over the years, is that we have been able to testify um, over at the State House. We've met with our local reps um, and senators to make sure that there is as strong a lead law um, as possible within the state. I think we've gotten that, but now there's no funding for it. Mm -hmm. um, so that is one thing that we're working on is that lobbying. And also, Chelsea still does not have a lead inspector. So that when people call the local Board of Health, they're referred to the state, and the state has said, well, there's a six-month wait. Um, and that's not acceptable to us. So what we're hoping to do is put more pressure at the local level, but also meet with local banks so that money is made available for deletting as well as our community development program. Right. Right. I don't know, Owen, if you have a word of advice for parents, just as we hear about the, the difficult and painful treatment for lead poisoning. You... Well, I think screening of all children is essential. And um, the thing is that you can screen a child with a relatively simple uh, test, which screens also for iron deficiency anemia. Mm -hmm. And these are two common enough issues uh, in childhood that I think, uh, certainly in this state, uh, it makes good sense to have that done. Uh, as Paul mentioned earlier, uh, we're actually involved in uh, promulgating a screening schedule to be in compliance with the lead law. And uh, we expect that schedule to be uh, available for public comment in, in, the, in the relatively near mm -hmm. future. Mm -hmm. 
but even uh, without such a screening schedule, without such a law, um, uh, parents should insist that at some point their children be checked for lead poisoning right. and for anemia, which right. can done be, be done by one simple finger stick test. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's good for them to know. Well, now I think we've heard about the problem and the existence of lead paint. The next question is, how does one get rid of lead paint? Paul began to talk about de-leading. Um, and in the next tape, we have another representative from the Mass Association of Lead Paint Analyzers, a de-leader, David Rugato. Tell us about his work in de-leading homes. Um, the tape will be a good lead-in to a discussion of that process. So why don't we take a look at that tape now? Um, I'm going to discuss some deletting techniques and some problems associating with the deletting industry. Um, hopefully, it'll be helpful for the homeowner, landlord, or whoever is, is going to be doing this type of work. The first subject would be choosing a contractor to do the inspections and to do the deletting work. Um, there's a number of criteria that you should have when choosing a contractor. Um, I would first of all require all contractors to furnish referrals and then call those referrals and ask the people how the, the contractor did, how thorough they were, and if there were any problems involved in the job. The second thing that I would do is I would check and make sure that they were following all the regulations and, and rules governing the particular field, which is deletting. Um, at this time, the state requires deletters to be certified. What the certification process means at this point is not to clear. So by the, the person that's doing the work, getting the work done by the contractor, should definitely do, do the checking himself because the state doesn't have enough funding and people to do it for them. As far as what the deletter has to follow for laws and regulations, I'll just briefly say, first of all, for the, the person involved, they can pick up any kind of this information at the State House Bookstore in Boston. Um, there's a, a number of regulations which will be mentioned later that the, the homeowner or landlord can get. Um, as far as surfaces that need to be deleted, um, according to the municipality or the area of the state that the, the home is located in, this is going to vary. Um, basically, in, in some of the cities, they have their own regulations, and the state of Massachusetts has its own regulations, and the federal government has its own regulations. Um, it, it wouldn't be worth going into each particular spot that has to be done. But as far as Massachusetts law is concerned, the surfaces that have to be deleted are what they consider chewable and biteable surfaces. Any surface that protrudes more than a half an inch at a 90 degree right angle is considered chewable and biteable. And even though you may look at the surface and say that is not chewable or biteable, that is what the law says. So try to try to back up from the subject a little bit and consider it a little bit differently. Um, on windows, all parts of the window basically have to be done that are movable or strikable. On doors, um, depending on the area, once again, for the most part, it's the chewable, all the edges of the door, the casings, and the jam. Um, other parts of rooms, such as chair rails, um, baseboards that come to a, an exterior 90 degree corner, the corner would have to be done. Um, on the exterior of the house, there's many, many areas that have to be done, but just keep in mind that they're, if they're chewable or biteable. In other words, it's not everything from five feet and down has to be taken off. It's only certain areas, certain specific areas. Um, that causes a lot of panic sometimes. People think from five feet down you have to gut it. As far as walls go, as was mentioned earlier, a defective wall, say a plaster wall that has lead on it or in it, if it has a hole in it, all that has to be done is the hole has to be fixed, repaired. Now, in some places that is, that, that'll vary, but for the most part, you have to make it intact again. Same with ceilings. If the paint is flaking off the ceilings, um, that would have to be scraped and repainted. The outside of buildings, this is a major problem. The siding on the outside is, you know, every couple of years it becomes defective and you have to repaint your, your building. Um, basically, you just scrape off what's loose and repaint it. Now, that has to be done carefully and following the laws that the delighting involves. In the other areas, it would have to be stripped right to the bare surface, the chewable areas.
What are the various methods you use to de-lead? The first method I'll describe is dry scraping. Dry scraping is, is by far the most common method in the state of Massachusetts. Um, what dry scraping involves is a crew of men going into the unit that has to be deleaded and using hand scrapers, they scrape the paint off of the surface to be deleaded right down to the bare wood. It's as simple as that. There's a number of, of precautions that have to be taken when this method is being used so the unit won't be contaminated. Um, I'll discuss that in a few minutes. Then another method that is involved is chemical. There are several chemicals that are used to de-lead properties, and I won't go into the background of these chemicals, but they're applied on the surface. The paint is taken off with this chemical, and that is, that is how basically that's done. Another method is replacement. Oftentimes, it will be a, a little cheaper or um, more cost-effective on the whole to replace certain items. If, if a window is in very bad shape, the sash would you know, be replaced oftentimes. The same with a door unit, um, chair rails. It could, could have involved many, many different surfaces that you could replace rather than strip the paint off of. This would have to be done by a company that was qualified to do it. In other words, you don't want to have the work done and have it come out poorly. Another method is covering. On the exterior, oftentimes you can cover with vinyl siding. Um, aluminum can be used on the exterior. Um, vinyl can be used to cover certain sections of casings and jams. Um, covering can also be done on the inside on limited occasions. You can cover with plywood, you can cover with vinyl and aluminum once again. But it depends on the situation is going to warrant if that's applicable or not. Another method that isn't as widely used in this state, but I'll mention it briefly, is machine sanding. Several companies do do machine sanding, and when they do this, there has to be very careful precautions taken so that the dust isn't spread around. In other words, it has to be hooked up to a special vacuum system that is very expensive, but that's the only way that they can do that particular method. What are the precautions you take when deleading? First of all, any deleading that is to be done on the interior of the unit always, always is going to revolve around the fact that plastic is being put down on all surfaces. The floors um, have to be covered with 6 mil plastic. The, the work area has to be completely sealed off from all other areas of the house. All items in the rooms, if it's occupied or in closets has to be removed and covered. Um, in other words, the furniture can stay in the room, but it has to be covered uh, extremely carefully so that they can't be contaminated whatsoever. On the exterior, it's very important also to have plastic down. If you're repainting the home or if you're doing deletting work, um, there has to be plastic to catch all the debris that's on the exterior. And this has to be very carefully vacuumed up afterwards if something gets on because of of the soil problem. The soil can become contaminated by lead dust and, and chips. And that's a, a whole other ball game basically, but there, there's a, it's a very expensive and very difficult situation to deal with soil that gets contaminated. So it's best to catch everything before it gets into the soil. What precautions do you take with your workers when deleting? This is a typical uh, uniform that would be used by a deletter. Um, different deletters would have different manufacturers of this equipment, but it all does the same thing. First of all, the body suit is very important. It protects the, the worker from having any contaminants on him at all. And this is, is, is applied and removed before they exit the work area. This mask that, that he has on, there's, very diff there's many different kinds of these masks available, but this is one. It purifies the air and then it, it pumps it into him so it's no effort to breathe it in. This is required on most of the methods to have this, this supplied air system. He also wears a pair of the, these gloves that are impregnable um, to protect his hands and the, the head and the feet also have to be totally covered. That can be done in a number of different ways but this particular one is a full body suit. In other words, all of him, him is covered. The mask itself has many different filters that, that filter out all the different kinds of part particles of lead. 
whether it's being a chemical or dust. This takes it all out, so he won't breathe anything that it's going to damage him in. Um, as far as after the delighting work is done, depending on any of the methods that are involved, um, the cleanup is the most important part of the job. Now, all the uh, plastic that has caught all the contaminated lead particles has to be removed and taken off the site. The entire site gets specially vacuumed up with what they call a, a HEPA vacuum. And it's a special vacuum that the state says has to be used and it catches the, even the, the smallest minute particles of lead so it can't be spread around. And then the entire unit has to be washed down with what's called sort of trisodium phosphate. This has to be done and it has to be done very thoroughly. At the end of the job, what is issued is a compliance certificate, and that's the whole idea of, of having the deletting done for a number of different reasons. Um, this certificate will not be issued unless the job is done correctly and it's been assured that it is safe from all contaminants. Uh, how long does a deletting take? A deletting can take anywhere from one day to one month, depending on the size of the property. It's not a process that's done very quickly. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of preparation, a lot of time, and a lot of cleanup involved, depending on what method will directly determine how long it takes. And what is the cost involved? The, the cost is, is very expensive, actually, in terms of what's being done, though. Um, it can vary from, I would say, $500 to uh, $10,000 per seven-room apartment, depending on how many surfaces have lead-based paint on them and what remedy has to be used. Why is deleading so important? The major reason for deleading is obviously to protect our children from lead paint poisoning. Um, the documented cases are, are extremely high in lead paint poisonings and the deleading is principally to alleviate that problem, to protect the children from accidentally poisoning themselves when they don't know any better. Welcome back to the studio. We've just been watching a demonstration and a discussion of the deleting procedure. Um, if you've just joined us, this is Dead Air Live, and our subject tonight is lead paint, controlling the risk. I've been joined here in the studio by three new guests, and I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce them. Um, and to welcome them. To my left is Benjamin Hiller, an attorney from Cambridge uh, who's done some legal work on the issue of lead paint. And to his left is Pamela Witowski, a landlord from Chelsea, who's also an attorney. And to her left is Ronald Grasso of the Malden Redevelopment Authority. Welcome to you all and, and thanks for being here. Um, I think that the tape we just saw has raised some questions about the deletting procedure and especially um, not only the risk, but the cost of deletting. Um, Ron, do you have some thoughts on the cost of deletting? Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, through my experience in Malden, the cost, people come in and say, how much is it going to cost to delet our apartment? And it's, it reflects to the landlord because the landlord is going to pick up the cost. We use a rule of thumb that it runs about a thousand dollars per room. So a five room apartment will cost a landlord approximately $5,000. Now that doesn't even count the outside. How much does it cost to de-lead the outside? Well, if they're going to paint it, a two-family will run around $3,000. If they're going to side it, now it's going to cost about $9,600. Mm -hmm. Presently, there is a bill at the State House that's in committee that's going to fund approximately $12 million. We hope it will be passed sometime in June. What this will do, will allocate a certain amount to each city and town where we can pass this along to the landlords to supplement the cost of this deletting, which is very, very costly. As a landlord myself, I have gone through this, and I know what certain landlords are faced with. Uh, so basically, we need help. Mm -hmm. The people should try to talk to their reps, their senators, and tell them that we need this lot well, this bill passed. Right. We need the money. <laughs> yes. um, Pamela, I know you've, you've deleted your home. Um, what was your experience and, and what were the costs involved? I know um, I've heard the advice that it's very important to choose a good deletter 
How, how did, what was your experience and how did you decide to de-lead? Well, um, I didn't have any, a list of any de-leaders or I, I didn't really know what to do. So mm -hmm. I just went to the yellow pages mm -hmm. and I chose the name of uh, a de-leader, uh, excuse me, of a, a, a tester and um, who subsequently provided me with a, a list of uh, the names of some de-leaders. Mm -hmm. So uh, the tester came down and tested the property and um, made up a list of what uh, in the property needed to be deleted, what parts of the property. Um, this was in December of 1987, and at that time we were having some tenants move into a two-family that I own in Chelsea, mm -hmm. and um, they were going to be moving in with some children uh, under six years old, and. Um, we had so we had the apartment tested and they did find some lead paint fortunately there wasn't that much lead paint and we had a de-letter come in and de-lead it cost approximately a thousand dollars and uh, we didn't have any any lead de uh, on the outside of the home everything was all in the inside of the apartment and um, we had the de-letting done prior to them moving in and it took approximately two days uh, for them to de-lead and after they deleaded, we had the uh, lead paint tester come back and certify that the property had been deleaded mm -hmm. in compliance with the state law. Right, that's great. Well, that was a little bit more inexpensive than what uh, mm -hmm. Ron has been talking about on the cost of of deleading. Yeah. Um, Pamela has mentioned six year children under six years of age, and I think um, for those who don't know what the law. Um, the law says, perhaps Benji could give us an idea of, of the law. Sure, uh, the, the law in Massachusetts is, is, is very strong and very explicit. It says if you rent an apartment to a, or a house to a family with children under the age of six, then the apartment must be in compliance with the, the state regulations, which say that um, there uh, they can't be led. It's now up to, to five feet on uh, what's defined as chewable surfaces, that is the woodwork, and mm -hmm. any uh, shipping or cracking or peeling paint that contains lead has to be made intact. Um, j just to go, go back to the comments that, the, the, to, that, that were made previously, um, in terms of the cost, um, I spend uh, about 80 or 90 percent of my work time uh, representing the young children who have been lead poisoned and their families. And so I view the cost somewhat differently. To mm -hmm. me, the cost of a child being lead poisoned um, is uh, far exceeds any financial expense that the landlord has to go through, and so it's just to keep in balance what the what the costs are, the costs of the child are probably uh, not really calculable in terms of what, what's the cost of someone not being able to reach their potential. But even the cost to the to the society in terms of of the the loss of a productive member of society mm -hmm. or the loss of some of their productivity. Um, it's been my experience in terms of both inspectors and de-letters, and I think that it's, it's, it is improving because there now is some more regulation of them, that the majority of them are incompetent, that the majority of the testers um, don't do an accurate job of testing and often miss places where there's, where there's lead both on their initial inspections and on re-inspections. Mm -hmm. And the majority of people who, uh, who, who, who do the de-letting don't do a, a complete job and don't do the cleanup properly and contribute to kids getting poisoned. Now, as I say, that is uh, changing some. There's now some regulation about licensing and, and training inspectors and de-letters, although unfortunately, as, as far as I understand, most of the money for that has been held up in the, in the budget crunch, and it's unclear when or if it's, it's ever going get, to get out of uh, the legislature. Right, so it's important if, if one is going to de-led to get somebody who is Good. Is going to do a good job and do a good cleanup That's and, right. and, and make and the home be, safe. And to be sure that the the children are as far away from the place as you can get them mm -hmm. while the de-letting is going on. Don't bring the kids back at night, and make sure that the cleanup has been been done properly. And don't rely on the people who the landlord's hiring to do the cleanup. Because as I say, my experience has been that most of the time they don't do the job properly, and right. the kids get repoisoned. Right. Right. Um, well, what are some of the rights and responsibilities of a landlord impl as implied by, by the lead law? Well, the responsibility is to make sure that the, the, there is no lead hazard in a property that's rented to a family with children under the age of six. Um, if a child gets poisoned while living in the property, um, the landlord is liable for those injuries and they can be dramatic. Uh, in addition, when a child is poisoned, uh, by regulation, the poisoning is reported to the Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Program or in some cities to the city uh, 
Department of Health, and there's a, an inspector sent out, and the landlord gets a copy of a report that said this, says there is lead present and lists the places that the lead is present. The landlord then has an obligation to bring the property into compliance within seven days. Mm -hmm. And if they fail to do that, the, the damages that they're liable for can be up to four times the, the damage that the child suffers. The legislature, in passing the statute, was obviously very concerned about a very serious problem and wanted to make the penalties very serious to make sure that the landlords clean up. Unfortunately, what seems to be happening is that the remedies are mostly remedial. By the time someone comes to me, the kid's already been poisoned, and the, we're, lock, we're locking the barn door after the horses have escaped. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to put myself out of business. I would like to find something else to do with my time rather than representing lead poisoned children. I'd like to see the problem dealt with. Right. And with all due respect to Paul Hunter, who I like and respect and think does a good job, the majority of kids that get poisoned are poor children who live in the inner cities and are, are predominantly black and Hispanic mm -hmm. and Asian. And in my view, the reason that the problem hasn't really been dealt with, even though the statute in Massachusetts has been on the books for 17 years, is because those are the kids that get poisoned, and they don't have any access to, to power, and they don't have the, the, the kinds of advocates that they should. And if lead poisoning were an infectious disease that was affecting uh, upper middle class white kids, it would be on the front page of the Globe every day, and it would have been solved 20 years ago. Right, right. Yeah. Well. What, in your opinion, I mean, the law is supposed to be a prevention law. Do you, do you feel that it is so? Well, it was passed in 1972 and took effect in 1973, and the estimates are that there's probably 2,000 kids a year getting poisoned in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So I think the answer to the question is clearly no. Right, um, right. And I think that that's for a variety of reasons. The, the basic reason is the one I, the one I cited. Mm -hmm. I think that um, many families of, of lead poisoning kids don't realize that they have very, very strong legal rights and don't pursue them. And that if they did, then that would, for the wrong reasons, intimidate landlords into cleaning mm -hmm. up their property. Mm -hmm. uh, most people don't do what, what you did, which is to de -lead before someone moves in, which is the responsible and appropriate thing to do. They de -lead only after the kid's been poisoned and only then because they're forced to. Um, and they increase, obviously, the chance of repoisoning. Doing it the way you did prevents that problem, and that's what, that's what people should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think that if uh, legislation was passed that said that, number one, you cannot transfer property in Massachusetts unless you have a lead certificate. If people bought houses recently know you have to have a fire detection certificate or you can't transfer property. You can't register it in the registry of deeds. If the same thing were done when property was transferred regarding um, any multiple family dwelling, for you were required to have a lead certificate, the property was in compliance with the lead law, um, then the problem would be dealt with relatively quickly. Property turns over pretty quickly in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And the cost of, uh, of doing the lead abatement work, as you were describing, would, uh, would be amortized over the period of a mortgage. And there's a tremendous difference between reaching in your pocket to take out $10,000 and having it added to a $150,000 mortgage where it, it it's 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 much less of a much less of a burden on on people. Right. Well, as as Ron mentioned, the the cost. Um, well, in Malden, at least, there are some low interest loans available, yes, and there are. right, and that can help out with the cost. Um, of course, it doesn't measure up quite to the cost, as you pointed out, loss of potential. Can you explain the the low interest yes, loan program? We have two programs in Malden that would. Uh, appeal to these type of people. Uh, we have a low interest loan program for 5% and the highest is 8. The 8% 8 has no income cap on it. Mm -hmm. Every loan that we give out in the city of Marlin has a lead paint inspection along with a code inspection. So we try to take care of the problem before this problem does arise. Mm -hmm. In the last two years, to my recollection, we've probably had only two serious lead uh, paint cases. And they were taken care of as soon as we could. We give those type of cases priority. But Malden, I feel, has done uh, an adequate job as far as this problem is concerned. Mm -hmm. Sure, there's, there's more houses or apartments out there that we haven't gotten to, but we're, we're getting to them. Mm -hmm. We advertise our program in the local papers, we talk in each ward, and we tell these people to get a, a low interest loan, they have to have a lead paint inspection. Mm -hmm.
that goes along with the code inspection and then we will we will give the loan but like I said before the lead paint does take a lot of that loan money so if we get some help from our legislators mm -hmm. we can use some of that grant money along with our loan money and I think more people will come forward Right. I know there's a tax credit available as well to, yes. to people who have deleted um, their home and that, that may be worth looking into for, for landlords who, who own property. Um, do you have any ideas on how many units have been deleted because of the law? I know that's, that's probably a figure that, that can't be judged. Well, in Malden, see, I'm very familiar mm -hmm. with Malden. Right. Uh, we average approximately 125 units per year. Mm -hmm. Um, so we are up there because, like I said, every, every loan that we issue mm -hmm. has to have a lead paint inspection. And then if we do detect lead, it has to be certified that the lead has been removed. Mm -hmm. And one thing I like to uh, point out here, a lot of times the, the, the way or the method of deleading uh, is replacing, especially windows and things. It's, mm -hmm. it's more cost effective to replace than to delead. And we find, besides deletting it, we're, and if we're doing energy-related items and things like that. So a lot of times, it's better to replace mm -hmm. than to. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, that's good. To, good to point out for property owners who may yes. not know, um, replacement is might be the way to go. Um, if people have uh, need in more information, it's available from TriCap and from the City Hall in Somerville. Um, I think that information will be available. Um, on the show here. Um, well, I'd just like to thank you all for being here. It seems that, Pamela, you haven't had that big a problem, as is pointed out by both Benji and, and Ron. Um, but thank you all for being here. It's been very informative. And hopefully, more homes will be deleted and fewer children will be poisoned. And you'll be out of a job, Benji. <laughs> thanks again for being here. And um, thanks for joining us at Dead Air Live tonight.